Hey guys, we've got the Savage 99C today, chambered in 308 Winchester. Just a beautiful gun. Thought I'd try to take it out to 600 yards today. And we're going to talk a little bit about this very nice Weaver scope. This, this scope is a K6. It was made in El Paso, Texas. And uh, the adjustments are a quarter of an inch increments. And we're using 168 grain Sierra Match Kings. I'm just going to set it up here and got my load data all ready to go. We'll see if uh, that scope is going to adjust. As far as I can figure, they, they started manufacturing these K6s, I believe in like 1948. Because of the vintage of uh, the firearm that came off of I'm I'm thinking that this this k6 is probably around 1960s vintage you know scopes in the early 1900s were like the Commodore computer of the 70s they might catch on so there were a lot of guys that were very much set in their ways and they wouldn't go out into the woods without iron sights and if they did have a scope they'd have to be able to rely on those iron sights if the scope failed there were really only a handful of producers of, of scopes at the time. There was J. Stevens Arms and Winchester were probably the most well-known in the early 1900s in the United States. But at the time, none of the glass was really uh, of a quality that, you know, really would make people want to go out and spend a one or two week salary on to get, so... And then another United States manufacturer, J.W. Fecker, uh, were very popular. And a gentleman by the name of Hugh Nertle worked for Fecker prior to starting his own scope company. And you might remember the Hugh Nertles from the sniper rifles, those, those fixed power 10 Hugh Nertles with all those fancy scope mounts. In the 20s and the 30s, the choices for scopes were pretty limited. You had uh, a NOSC or Noski, however you want to pronounce it. They sold for about $50, and you could get a Zeiss for about $70, but neither included a mount. And uh, Bill Weaver came out with the 330, complete with a mount, and it sold for $19, and he eventually got that price down considerably. By 1934, Weaver was selling his Model 329 scope with mounts, for four dollars and seventy five cents you could buy the four power and that was a whopping eight dollars one of the interesting things about Weaver was is he did design all of his uh, the tooling to manufacture these and the bluing is just exceptional for for uh, a scope finish and he really just uh, he insisted that everything may be made in the United States of America and his first business that he started out was in Kentucky. Up, uh, Bill Weaver moved to El Paso, Texas in 1933. And then within 10 years, he became the largest manufacturer of rifle scopes in the world. I mean, living the dream, right? And during World War II, he uh, actually manufactured 36,000 uh, scopes for the U.S. military. And through that research and development to provide services for the military. Uh, he introduced the one inch tube on the uh, on his scopes because it basically allowed more light in and it provided a better picture. And this particular scope was uh, introduced in 1948 and I think it's probably 1960s vintage, this one, and you're talking about an optic that's this old. I've got the data for these 168 grain Sierra Match Kings, and we're going to see if we can just dial up with this uh, at least 50 or 60 year old optic. I got my data, and we're 
we're using we're using Sierra 168 grain Match Kings. They have a a BC of 462, but we're we're beginning to discover that ballistic coefficient is based on velocity. So it has a BC of 462 at the muzzle velocity of 2650. But as velocity decreases, your ballistic coefficient decreases as well. So you can figure that between 100 yards, it's 2,600 feet per second, and 600 yards, it's going to be down to 1,674 feet per second. So that ballistic coefficient is constantly changing as velocity decreases. So you can't use it as a fixed number. What I usually do is I'll... I'll average between the two. I'll find out what the range is starting out and where it ended, and I will kind of take the middle of that to use a, a ballistic coefficient number that might be a little bit more accurate. So, this, the turrets on this, they're not marked. I mean, after, you know, I've got Cytrons and Vortex and, and Nikon uh, BDC reticles. And this is kind of old school, and I've marked where the gun is zeroed on both. But it's very, very easy for you to lose your uh, your previous position. So, in most of the the count up, uh, most of your ups, they'll say, okay, one zero, two two minutes, four point eight, eight point, and it just basically counts up. But in this particular case, so I don't get lost I'm basically just adding so for 200 I zeroed at 100 now so I'm gonna put 2 in for 2 I'm gonna add 2 8 for, for uh, 3 and I'm gonna kinda keep track of where I am so at any time I can go back to 0 because these turrets don't have 0 stops on them you gotta figure uh, 60 years ago or so a you know scope technology was kind of in its infancy so let's try this, and this will all work. I'm gonna put my limb saver on here. This will all work as long as I keep track of what I'm doing here. So we're gonna take a shot at 100 first, and I'm just gonna single load these as I'm doing my workups. There's a target at. You'll just be able to hear the report, hopefully. One at 100. So we've got a verifiable zero. Now I'm going to add two. And these clicks are very, very subtle. They're not. And up is counterclockwise. I need to go up two. That's a total of eight quarter minutes. It's blowing left to right pretty good, so I might start doing a little bit of hold off, but here's 200. Okay. Now we're going to add 2.8 on top of that. That's 275 for 300. Well, with a 6 magnification, things are getting a little smaller than I'm used to. Okay, the plate swung left, which means I'm still hitting left, which is pretty good. So we got to add another 3.2. 60-year-old scope, what a hope. That's 3.25. 400 yards. A lot of times I set these shots up. I have to be honest with you, I have not done this on this particular shoot here. Okay, 
I'm just going to hold left shoulder. And that bullet went right. Elevation was good. So I'm going to start putting in a little bit of left windage. That's four inches. That's eight inches. I got a feeling I'll be able to hold dead on now. <laughs> as long as I turn the turret the right direction, right? Yep. How many times have you done that? Went the exact opposite way. Okay. Aim right at the, the button in his lapel. Wow, still left. Okay, this is round two. And I think I got lost with windage last time. So it should be zeroed at 100 right now. Let's see if it went back to zero. That would be interesting. Did you go back to zero? Let's see. 60 year old scope? Yes, it did. Gonna add two to it. for 200. I could just hold high if I didn't want to dial, but I want to stay with this. Wind is ripping to the left. Normally I would put in a minute at this point, and I'm gonna. To the left. And I'm also gonna go up an additional 2.8. That's 2.75. For 300. Keep in mind, this is a 50 year old, 60 year old gun and a 60 year old scope on here. Dust blow way off hard to the right. 400, 3 2. be enough. It's a hard day to be doing this because the wind is kind of whipping out there. Okay, 400. I might, I'm going to put it right on his, uh, right in the center of where your tie would hang. did not see where that hit was. I'm going to go to 5 now. 3.7 up. That's 3.75. 6 power scope. When you're used to the big stuff, this is everything's got it, your your form has got to be perfect now. That was a hit. Hopefully you heard it on the camera. Maybe just for giggles, we'll try it one more time. Okay, 
two in a row. 600, 4.1 minutes in addition. Four two five. Now this one here, I have a feeling the wind is really going to take take hold on it. Wouldn't hurt to add a minute to the left. It's going to need more than that. That's six inches. Let's start there. Like I said, it's very important that your form is really good when you're when you have uh, such a uh, a small magnification and a good sight picture. Squeeze the gun should go off without you even knowing it. It should be a surprise. This trigger is about six pounds, so I'm kind of cranking back on it pretty good. I'm going to hold left right in the middle of the plate up there and it went left so I'm gonna try one more it's actually you look at the dust splash up there it's gusting the other way up there this one should have it though It wouldn't be any fun, right? Okay. okay. All that is uh, bad wind call on my part. I think the scope dial up on the scope is quite good. This is a four round. Let's see here. Okay, so I'm holding a little high in the target, right in the middle, sort of depending on how the wind decides to blow it. Let's toss those round, and then we're going to take it down to 100. That'll come down 15.8 minutes. So 15 times 4, I went to a risk any 60 and 8, so 63 down. That's zero. And the wind. That's zero. So let's see if it's on at a hundred. That's a lot of clicks. Yep. This is a publication of Guns Magazine edition September 1955 and uh, on the second page in they have some Weaver scopes in there 
and I was kind of interested at the price at the time. Uh, in 55, the Model K6 would sell for a whopping $48.50. The KV, which was a variable power, sold for $57.50, and the K8 and K10 uh, sold for $59.50. That was a chunk of change back in 1955 because uh, that might have equated to somebody's whole week of salary. And uh, I guess it was money well spent if it still works today in 2018, right? Egg. We're going to finish up with these. I really appreciate you guys uh, watching my videos. It keeps me making new ones. I think we would all agree that this Weaver K6 is a very fine scope and if you get a chance to pick one up I'll try to put these last three rounds on that plate at 300 hopefully it's doable Thanks for watching, and I'll be doing another video within the next couple days or so. Have a good weekend.